Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Fields. I am the Wage and Hour Division Manager for the State of Michigan. Welcome, everyone, to our Youth Employment Standards Act webinar today. I see many of you are joining. I'm very excited to have a very good turnout on this, and I appreciate you taking time out of your day to attend. Our focus today is going to be on the Youth Employment Standards Act, but we're also going to talk briefly about other acts that are enforced by Wage and Hour. This has been a tremendous year uh, for all of us. We're looking forward to things getting better and improving. And one of those things that we like to do is make sure we're sharing relevant information with you. So welcome everyone. I have two people that are going to help me present. Manager Jill Hookie, say hi Jill and also Senior Investigator Randall Harrison. So we are going to go ahead and get started. We are recording this so we can place this online for folks that weren't able to get in uh, at this time. So again, welcome everyone. I think you will find this very informative. Go to the next slide. Okay, I will kick us off here. This is Michigan State, uh, State of Michigan Wage and Hour Division. There's also a federal wage and hour that enforces federal law. State law is enforced by Michigan wage and hour. We're going to focus today mostly on youth employment, but I want you to know what other laws that we enforce. We enforce, again, Michigan's Public Act 90 Youth Employment, Michigan's Public Act 390, which is a payment of wages and fringe benefits, Michigan's Minimum Wage and Overtime Law, the Improved Workforce Opportunity Wage Act, Paid Medical Leave Act, Human Trafficking Notification, and Prevailing Wage on State-Funded Projects. Our mission is to provide fair, efficient, effective administration of the laws that we enforce. We want to keep minors safe. We want to educate employers and employees, uh, make sure that things that are required to be posted are done so. And again, we're here to offer information to everybody just so we can all be in compliance, which is what our main goal is. With that being said, in a welcome and an introduction, I will go ahead and have our senior investigator, Randall Harrison, will start us off on youth employment. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Randall Harrison. I'm one of the senior investigators here with the Michigan Wage and Hour Division. I'm gonna be speaking with you all today about the Youth Employment Standards Act, Public Act 90. So the Youth Employment Standards Act, it pretty much covers all Michigan employers who employ minors, which is defined as people who are under the age of 18 years of age. And um, it covers Michigan employers along with the Fair Labor Standards Act. And so since there are two laws, federal law and state law, the stricter standard applies. So state law, uh, stricter standard applies to these following issues. Um, excuse me, these, these following requirements. And it's the requirement to have a work permit, um, uh, uh, prohibiting employment in hazardous occupations. Um, we also um, have stricter standards in, in, in reference to the hours of employment, meal and rest periods, um, the mandation of adult supervision. And there is a posting requirement that will talk about in one of the later slides as well. So there have been some recent amendments to the act. So before March 21st, 2021, all work permits um, when they were made had to be made in person. So they couldn't be done over email or fax. So um, that amendment was made mainly because of the pandemic, when everything was closed down, of course, school districts were closed and schools were closed. So um, had to find a easier way for minors to, um, to get their work permits filled out and submitted to their employers. And in addition to that amendment, um, there, it, there, there was a change in how work permits are formatted. Before, 
the work permit for the minor that is under the under the years of eight, excuse me, under the years of 16, um, that work permit was on a pink paper. And then the work permit for the minor that is 16 and 17 years of age was on a yellow paper. So now they've changed it to where um, the work permit for the minor that is under the years of, under the age of 16, um, it clearly states that on the work permit and also that one is, um, in landscape format and then the work permit for the minor that is 16 and 17 years of age is in your standard um, uh, portrait format. So the minimum age for minors and also work permit. So the minimum age that a minor can be employed is 14 years of age. Now there are some exceptions when it when a minor is 11 to 13 years of age, they could work as a referee, um, a golf caddy, bridge caddy, or an umpire. Um, if you're 13 years of age, you can also work um, uh, setting traps at shooting events. Um, now, all minors that are not exempt from the act must have a work permit on file before they are allowed to work. There are no, there are no exceptions. Um, I see employers where they will allow someone to start on a Monday and that minor will promise them that they'll bring the work permit on Wednesday. Those days that they work Monday and Tuesday are in violation of the act because they do not have a work permit on file at that location. Also a work permit must be employer specific. So what that means, if an employer has two entities, so an employer has ABC Inc. and an employer has 123 Inc. If, if that employer wants that minor to work at both entities, you have to have a work permit for both entities. Now, a work permit continues to be valid as long as that minor stays employed. So if you have a minor working, let's just say summer of 2021, after the summer ends, they end employment, they go back to school, and then uh, once school lets out the following summer, they go back to be employed with that same employer, they have to get a new work permit. And when employment terminates, I mean, though, those work permits should be returned to the school. And also a work permit can be suspended, revoked, or refused by an issuing officer at any time. Um, and these are the reasons why that can happen. Now, there is an appeal process that, that has to be available if a work permit is revoked or suspended by that issuing officer. So a minor, this deals with supervision. So uh, minors may not be employed without adult supervision. The key word there is adult supervision because I've seen several times before where there's a minor that's 17 years of age and he or she has been made a manager and um, he's he or she is supervising minors that are younger than them, you know, 16 or 15 years of age. One minor cannot supervise another minor. It has to be someone that is 18 years of age or older. And when we and what we define as supervision is someone who can offer immediate assistance in the case of an emergency. So if you have a 5,000 square foot facility, the minor is at the front and the manager that is 18 years of age is at the back of the facility doing paperwork, that's not supervision because they're not um, going to be available if that minor needs assistance for any reasoning. And um, um, special penalties do apply when you're employing minors without supervision, when they're engaged in cash transactions um, after 8 p.m. or sunset. So sunset is within a law because of course in the fall, it gets dark, you know, at 536. So um, whenever you have a minor engaged in cash transactions, you have to make sure you have the proper supervision for him or her.
So minors cannot work in any establishment where alcohol sales exceed 50% or more. So those are your bars, your lounges, et cetera. Now the places where food or other good, goods um, exceed the 50%, which are your restaurants that sell alcohol like your uh, Chili's or Ruby Tuesdays, a uh, minor can work there, but they cannot work in the bar area and they cannot serve the alcohol. So when it comes to, to these facilities, um, a minor that is 14 or 15 years of age cannot work in or about or in connection with that part of the establishment that where the alcohol is being consumed or sold. And um, as I previously stated, minors cannot uh, sell or serve the alcohol according to the LCC regulations. So hazardous occupations. So we also deal with that. And this means um, that a minor cannot come in contact with any type of hazardous substances, uh, chemicals, explosives, et cetera. They cannot drive or work as an outside helper. The example there you see is a pizza delivery driver. Um, they cannot work in any jobs that is associated or in connection with the logging sawmill industry. They cannot use any woodworking machinery. Um, minors who are, who, are, who are less than 16 years of age cannot engage in any work where it involves using ladders, scaffolding, um, also brazing, welding, soldering, any type of heat treatment, uh, work on construction sites, excavation sites, bridges, streets, highways, any slaughtering, butchering, cutting meat, using meat slicers, cleavers, knives, and also any occupation that involves any type of power driven equipment, tools, saws, and machinery. Um, now, federally covered employers are subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act in regards to um, their hazardous occupation orders um, under the Child Labor Bulletin 101. So if you are a federally covered employer, I would advise that you also take a look at that documentation as well. So um, minors, um, when it comes to hours, there are specific hours that they can and they cannot work. So any minors that are not exempt from the act, they cannot work more than six days in a work week, an average of eight hours per day, 10 hours in one day, and they cannot work more than five hours without a 30 minute documented break. This is an issue I see all the time. Um, breaks may be provided, but they're not documented. So you do have to make sure that you are documenting those 30 minute breaks when they are being provided. So 14 and 15 year olds may not work more than 48 hours uh, of school and work combined. So if a minor is in school for 30 hours, they can't work more than 18 hours. Um, and they cannot work before seven or, or after 9 p.m. Now this is where the stricter standard comes into play because the because the federal government has a stricter standard for 14 and 15 year olds. So um, it is definitely best that you do take a look at both acts to ensure that you are in compliance with both of them. So 16 and 17 year olds, their hours are set at a standard 24 hours a week when school is in session. They, they, they cannot work 20, 25, they cannot work 26 as a standard 24. Now, uh, work weeks when school are not in session, which are your winter breaks, your spring breaks, winter breaks, summer vacation, they can work up to 48 hours in a work week. Now, they are, their hours differ. They can't work before 6 a.m. or after 10.30 p.m. on school days, which are defined as Sunday through Thursday. 
Now on weekends, which are defined as Friday through Friday and Saturdays, they can't work before six and after 11.30 p.m. So agricultural processing is a little different. So for 16 and 17 year old minors, when school is when school is not in session and they are provided with written consent from their parent or guardian, um, they cannot work any more than 11 hours in, in a work day. They can't work before 5.30 a.m. after 2 a.m. And they may not work more than 62 hours in a work week and not more than 48 hours if their parent um, does not provide them with the consent to do so. Hours deviation. So this office provides a deviation from the standard hours that we just discussed. So the general hours deviation um, sets things back um, an hour each way. So if you as an entity apply to our office for an hour's deviation, that will now allow the start time to start at 5 a.m. And then on school days, um, the minors working at your location can work until 11.30 p.m. Now on weekends, it's also 5 a.m but that also extends the end time from 11.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. Now, if you have a general hours deviation on file, you still have to have that parental or guardian consent um, that will allow them to either work before 6 a.m. or after 10.30 p.m. and then on weekends after the 10, excuse me, after the 11.30 p.m. up until the new time, which is 12.30 a.m. And then there, there's also an individual hours deviation if you have, um, for some odd reason, a minor has to be able to work after 12.30 a.m. or before 5 a.m. and individual hours deviation can be applied to for that specific minor. Um, it does have to have the uh, permission from their parent or guardian, and it and we have to see that it is in the best interest of that minor in order for it to be approved. Hazardous deviations and performing arts authorizations. So uh, we also do issue hazardous deviations as well, which will provide the minor um, the opportunity to engage in, in, a in a restricted classification that we have defined as something that a minor should not be doing. So uh, first of all, it cannot be a federally covered business. Um, it has to be a business that is, that is only subject to state of Michigan law when it, in reference to youth employment. And then um, it, as I explained with the hours deviation, it has to be shown that, that approving this deviation is in the best interest of the minor, that they are properly trained for whatever restricted job you are um, seeking that minor to do, and that they will be, um, be able to do that job safe. Um, haven't seen too many of those approved, but um, that is available if someone wants to apply for a deviation. So performing arts authorizations, um, the, these are applied to, to our office starting at 15 days old for any, any minor that wants to engage in any type of print or, or any other media, modeling, uh, television shows, movies, uh, theatrical, musical performances. Um, they have to have a performing arts authorization on file in order to engage. So um, any minor that is under the age of six, they have to have a verification from a doctor that they can engage. 
Um, and there has to be a letter of recommendation from, uh, from a school or a teacher for any school age children that, that wants to engage. Now, um, all these, these deviations and authorizations are um, applied through our office and they can be uh, approved or denied. And, and even if they are approved, if we see that um, there is not compliance with the act, they may be revoked at any time. And, and as previously stated, there is an appeal process if um, someone does not agree with that decision. So there are exemptions to the act. So if a minor is 16 years of age and they've graduated from high school, the act does not apply to them. But what that does not mean is that if they are exempt from the act, they cannot supervise other minors. So I see that all the time where go out to a location and, and I'll see that the minor is supervising other individuals. And the first thing that the employer will say, well, he graduated high school or she graduated high school. Um, they can't supervise other minors. Um, that is why the language within the act is adult supervision because all minors have to be supervised by an adult. So if you're 17 years of age and you pass the requirements to earn your GED, you are exempt from the act. If you're a minor that has emancipated from your parent or guardian, you are exempt from the act. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you are a minor that is a part of a co-op agreement, between your employer and your school, you are exempt from the act because that agreement is supposed to govern that employment to ensure your safety. Any minor that is engaged in any type of domestic chores and connection with a private residence, they are exempt. Um, in this one also, a minor that is employed in a business that is owned by his or her parent or guardian, that is your child. So you are responsible for your child's safety. So you, you really don't need the Youth Employment Standards Act to ensure the safety of your child. So that child would be exempt. So um, any minor that is uh, 14 years of age and, and they work at the school that they are enrolled, that school is responsible for, for the health and safety of that minor. Um, farm work, um, uh, uh, if the employment is not in violation of, of the standards established by our department and farm work is defined as practices performed on a farm as an incident or in conjunction with farming operations, including the preparation for market and delivery to storage market or carriers for transport to market. So they are also exempt from the act. What are the employer's responsibilities? There's a few here. The employer's responsibilities is to one, legally employ minors. They have to provide adult supervision at all times and provide those required breaks after five hours of continuous work. They must maintain a copy of the work permit or that proof of exemption or any, any deviations, any parental consents that must be at the work site. So um, if you have a business in Lansing and you have all the paperwork for the miner in Detroit and that miner is working in Lansing, that's not how it's supposed to be. The, the, the paperwork has to be where that minor is employed. So if they're working at your site in Lansing, their paperwork must be at that location. So employers must also maintain that daily time record of the total number of hours that that minor is working each day, showing their start and end times and also their break periods. That is very key because if this office receives a complaint 
and we go out and we perform an audit and we look at those time records and we see that the miner started at 8 a.m. and they ended at 5 p.m. But there's no documentation showing that a half an hour break was somewhere within that five hour period we're going to have to cite you because it's not documented. They may have received it, but we can't um, document a break, therefore it didn't happen. And there's also a posting requirement for youth employment that should be, we, we define it as in a conspicuous area where, where they can see it. And it pretty much has all the requirements of the act on that posting requirement. Now, this act is a criminal law and it is punishable as a misdemeanor um, with imprisonment up, up to a year in jail, a fine of $500, except um, there are two sections of the act where the penalties are a little more severe. And that is the one that <coughs> we spoke about earlier when it pertains to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when it pertains to a minor uh, working in cash transactions after 8 p.m. or sunset, and then 14A that pretty much deals with um, um, the solicitation of a mi minor for immoral purposes. So, um, so I really appreciate everyone's time today listening about this wonderful act, and I'm going <laughs> to send it back over to Jennifer. Thank you, Randall. I just to let you know, we do have quite a few questions in the chat. We're not ignoring you. We're going to do them at the end of it. We're going to take a few minutes and go through a couple other things of information for you, and then we will come back. But again, wonderful questions are in the chat, and we will be more than happy to go through this, and we will make this PowerPoint available to everybody. With that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Jill Hookey, who's going to take us through the next few slides. Manager Jill Hookey. Hello everyone. Thank you, Jennifer and Randall. I'm going to highlight a couple of the acts that are enforced by our division. The first one being the Payment of Wages and Fringe Benefits Act. I like to call it our meat and potatoes because it is probably the act we get the most activity under. It applies to most Michigan employees. So anybody who works in the state of Michigan, this law is going to apply to them. They do not have to be minors, it's all employees. It regulates the payment of wages, whether they be hourly, salary, a piece rate, or commission. Um, this law covers those wages. It requires that wages be paid on a regular basis, either weekly, bi-weekly, semi-monthly, or monthly. It permits payment of wages by US currency, negotiable check, direct deposit, or a payroll debit card. So the act of paying in cash is not illegal in the state of Michigan. What would be illegal and what people talk about is, well, so-and-so is being paid in cash. That would be because they're violating tax laws and not taking taxes out of the cash payments. But the act of actually paying a net figure in cash is not illegal, but of course, please get signed receipts because it didn't happen if you don't get something from an employee acknowledging that they received that cash. It restricts deductions from wages. So deductions that are allowed by law obviously have to be taken. So those would be your taxes, your court ordered garnishments, or if you have a collective bargaining agreement that allows for deductions from wages, those are all legally allowed deductions. For overpayment deductions, there's a carve out. If the overpayment resulted in a mathematical or typographical error. So if that occurred, you do not have to have somebody's written consent, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, provided a whole laundry list of things are met. So Again, the main thing is it had to be a clerical error. You couldn't knowingly loan somebody money or knowingly give them a fringe benefit like vacation prior to having earned it and call that an overpayment. It had to be like, oops, I hit a, an extra zero and paid somebody $1,000 instead of 100. So if it resulted as a clerical error, it can be taken without written consent if the 
recoupment of it happens within six months of the mistake. If the employee is given one pay period's written advance notice that it's going to occur and that it does not lower a person's gross wage rate below 15% and that it does not lower their gross wage rate below the state minimum wage rate, which we'll talk about under our next act and um, that all other employee elected deductions happen first, like 401ks, insurances, those types of things. For any other type of deductions from wages, you have to have the employee's full free and written consent allowing the deduction. So there's two different kinds, one that's to the benefit of an employer, one that's to the benefit of an employee. So one that's to the benefit of an employee would be things like your 401k deductions, your um, insurance deductions, anything that is beneficial, maybe a charity deduction. If it's one that's to the benefit of the employer, and the easiest way to look at this is maybe is the employer missing a piece of their cake and they're wanting to replace their piece of cake, then it's probably to the employer's benefit. Those deductions require an individual signed written consent for every deduction. So I, Jill Hookey, authorized ABC Incorporated to deduct $152 from my May 26th paycheck signed Jill Hookey. Then you can take that amount from my paycheck provided you don't lower me below minimum wage. So if I'm only making minimum wage, you're never going to be able to do it. Um, at that point, you would need to approach the employee about maybe repayment outside of a payroll deduction, or if an employee refused, take independent civil action for the recoup. Um, but you have to have one for every wage payment subject to a deduction when it's an employer benefit deduction. For an employee benefit deduction like insurances, you do still have to have signed written consent. Typically, it is your enrollment form, you know, the itty bitty tiny little print that says you're agreeing to all of that usually has that language in there. But what you have to do is make the employee or you as an employee be aware of what that amount's going to be. So for example, with the state, we're given information in August of, of our cafeteria plan. If we choose a certain company, how much our biweekly deduction is going to be effective on January 1st. And that's going to be the same amount every two weeks through the end of the calendar year when we get to pick another insurance again. So as long as you have that one, that piece, that initial enrollment and an understanding from the employee what the regular recurring amount's going to be on an employee benefited deduction, then you are legal with this act. It requires that fringe benefits such as vacation pay, sick pay, holiday pay, bonuses, and authorized reimbursement of expenses be paid in accordance with the terms set forth in whatever an employer puts in writing, whether it be in a handbook or a two party signed contract or an employment offer letter, as long as it's a document that says how the fringe benefit is earned, calculated, and paid then it's enforceable under this act. Now there is no law that says you have to have vacation or an employer has to provide it or holiday pay or bonuses. There's no law that says they have to reimburse you for expenses. There is a paid medical leave act, which Jennifer will cover um, shortly. But what the law does say is once an employer offers these things and puts it in writing, then the employer has to follow what's in writing and that's what we enforce. Now, does that mean a verbal contract isn't binding? Um, no, a verbal contract is binding, but it's not under our authority because this law and, and the law that we've been given the charge to enforce requires something in writing. So if somebody has a past practice or a verbal agreement, doesn't mean they're necessarily dead in the water. It means that wage and hour division is not the avenue for pursuit that they would have to file their own independent civil action to enforce that contract or past practice. We have to have something in writing. It prohibits employers from receiving payment from an employee as a condition of employment or continued employment. So an employer can't say, hey, I have 10 candidates. If you slip me a C note, I'll give you the job over the other nine. No, 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 no. Uh, that's against the law. You can't tell tipped employees, give me all your tips. 
or you're not going to work here. No, nope. those tips are that employees, you can't make that a condition of their employment. The law does require that when you when a person has paid their wages that they receive a retainable check stub and that check stub has to say um, identify has to have the identification of the earning period, the hours work, the gross wages paid, the deductions that were made from that pay, as well as any itemization of fringe benefits paid. Again, stressing it has to be retainable. So an employer can't write in the memo line of a check what all these things are because once an employee cashes that check, it is no longer in their possession, right? They can't keep it. So it has to be in a retainable form. The law does provide certain discrimination protection for employees. So ones who have filed a complaint with us have protection, people who speak with our investigators during an investigation, who might testify in a hearing or come to an employer on behalf of others regarding a potential violation of the act, they are protected from discrimination and can also file a discrimination complaint with our division. So that is my highlight of the Payment of Wages and Fringe Benefits Act. I'm gonna to speak to you a little bit about the Improved Workforce Opportunity Wage Act. This act is Michigan's minimum wage and overtime law. And it applies to any employer uh, who employs two or more employees 16 years of age or older in the state of Michigan. So any employer who only has one employee, we do not have jurisdiction for. Any employee that's under the age of 16, we do not have jurisdiction for. Our minimum wage does not apply to them. Now, if they're a federally covered business, the federal minimum wage does apply to people under the age of 16, but ours does not. Uh, same as a payment of wages and Fringe Benefits Act, the work has to be performed in Michigan in order for Michigan law to apply. It applies to any business that is not covered by the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, except, and Randall already hit on this, when there's a stricter standard between state and federal law, the stricter standard applies. So on a federally covered business, and typically as a general rule, businesses are covered by federal law if they gross more than $500,000 per year, not profit, but gross income, or individuals who are um, producing goods for interstate commerce, meaning they're gonna go across state lines and be sold, or they're coming in from state lines and being assembled or something to that effect. So again, any enterprise that grosses more than 500 grand a year and any individual who is involved in interstate commerce, as a general rule, there's a few exceptions that they pick up, are covered by the federal law. So when you have a business that is covered by the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act and the Improved Workforce Opportunity Wage Act, the employer has to follow the stricter standard. Right now, the state minimum wage is higher than the federal law. So we as an agency cover every employee in the state of Michigan for minimum wage purposes. Now, if somebody's making at least minimum wage or more and it's an overtime issue, then they're covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act, a federally covered employer is. So currently our law requires that $9.65 per hour be paid for every hour work. That's the current minimum wage. It is scheduled to increase on January 1st of 2022 to $9.87 per hour, provided that the state's minimum or unemployment rate average at the end of the calendar year is less than eight and a half percent. If it's more or equal to or more than eight and a half, the increase isn't going to happen and it will stay at 965. That actually happened January 1st of this year. Last year's unemployment rate due to the um, pandemic was higher than eight and a half percent. So the increase did not happen and it stayed at 965. Those updates will be available on our website as soon as we know them, but it's typically not until um, more towards mid-December, maybe even later if, if it's a really close number. So this law does allow 
a what we would call a sub minimum wage for 16 and 17 year olds. So I told you the, the current minimum wage is 965. The law does allow these 16 and 17 year olds to be paid 85% of whatever the current minimum wage is. So right now they can be paid $8.20 an hour. Tipped employees, and this would be individuals who customarily and regularly receive tips from customers, may be paid 38% of the current minimum wage rate. So that's a, a minimum of 367 an hour. That is only if they report tips in writing equal to or greater than minimum wage at the end of a pay period. So if, if an employer has a tipped employee, let's say a server, they have to inform that server that they're going to take a credit on minimum wage for the tips that they receive. So the employee has to be informed. Then they have to be told what their cash hourly rate is going to be. The minimum is 367. It can be higher, but the minimum is 367. Then at the end of each pay period, that tipped employee has to provide a written statement saying, I, Jill Hookie, received, you know, $265 worth of tips this pay period, then my employer would have to look at how many hours I worked, how much cash wage I was paid, how much tips did I receive, and make sure that the tips received and the cash wage paid divided by the number of hours worked is equal to or greater than the minimum wage rate. And if it's not, the employer is obligated to make up that difference. For 16 and, seven, or 16 and 19 year olds, there is a training wage for the first 90 days of employment. So an employer can basically have a probationary period of trying somebody out at 425. But as soon as they are done with those 90 days, they have to be paid the applicable wage rate. So whether that be 820 for a 16 and 17 year old, 965 for somebody um, over 17, um, and that is a, a 90 day period regardless of a break in service. So let's say you have a seasonal business that's open from Memorial Day to Labor Day. You hire somebody on August 15th. They work from August 15th to Labor Day, and then they come back on Memorial Day and work for you. Those days back from August 15th to Labor Day count towards the 90 days. And I, I would actually challenge you to find anybody to go to work right now for 425. <laughs> so um, that's a caveat. We don't see it being utilized very often. Right. Uh, it does require time and a half, um, a, a person's regular rate of pay for hours worked over 40 in a seven day work week. So it is not over 80 in a bi weekly pay period, it is over seven in a work week. Um, unless they're exempt. And there's very few exemptions. It's basically your salaried managers who have a lot of independent discretion and judgment who are exempt. I will caution um, people on tipped employees. So if you say that a tipped employee is gonna be paid $5 an hour, and I'm going to take a $4.65 per hour tip credit on minimum wage, you cannot take $5 and multiply it by time and a half and say that's your overtime rate. When you hire a tipped employee, their wage agreement is still minimum wage. You're just taking a credit on minimum wage. So in my scenario, the credit being taken was $4.65 per hour. So for overtime, you would take $9.65, multiply it by time and a half, and then subtract that $4.65 that would give you your appropriate overtime rate. Um, the same scenario if you have an employee working in two different occupations and they have two different wage rates, if they go into an overtime situation, they have to be paid a weighted average between the, the two positions. So you take all the hours worked at one rate, come up with the gross earnings, take all the hours at the other rate, come up with the gross earnings, add them together, divide it by total number of hours worked in that work week to come up with what their regular rate of pay would be for that week. And then you multiply out the overtime and regular wages based on that regular rate of pay. And now I'm going to hand it 
Jennifer. Okay, Jill, it is 2.15. I would just like to really quickly go through the end of these slides. We have over 46 questions in our chat, in our, our Q&A. So I would like to maybe just, I'll just run through these real quick. Uh, paid medical leave, Michigan's act requires employers to have 50 or more employees that work anywhere in the U.S. or its territories to provide eligible employees with 40 hours of paid medical leave. There are 12 groups, uh, 12 categories of employees that are not eligible. One of those is people under the age of 18. The employee ha employee has to follow the employer's customary practice for requesting leave, and there's a posting requirement get the poster online for free. We're gonna provide this PowerPoint to you so you will have it. Do you wanna go to the next slide, Jill? Thank you, Jill. There's Michigan's Wage and Hour also enforces a Human Trafficking Notification Act. This act requires certain entities display a poster saying who to contact if you suspect human trafficking. These. Uh, posters are available on our website in eight different languages. Feel free to take a look at those. They're just certain entities that have to display them that are on the side of the uh, slide there. Can we go to the next one, Jill? Record keeping, resources and services. I think this will be helpful. Employers should maintain time and payroll records for three years. These are the things that we ask them to maintain. Everything's fine while the employee's working, but as soon as they leave or they file a complaint, they can come back up to three years later on a minimum wage claim. So we ask you to maintain these time and payroll records for three years. Can we go to the next slide, Jill? Posters, there are a couple questions in the chat about posters. You never have to buy these posters. You can go on our website and download them. Now, if you wanna to go to a local stationery store and buy a nice five in one poster, you're welcome to do that but you never have to. You can download these posters for free from our website. Go to the next one. Here's a way to get in touch with us. We do publications, we do speaking engagements, we investigate complaints. If you have a, a minor that you don't believe is working the correct hours or in hazardous, you can file a complaint online. We'll investigate that. If you're an employer that has questions, call our office. Um, if you know somebody that didn't get paid their paycheck, they can file a complaint with us as well. So certainly feel free to reach out to us. Here is our contact number and information. And here's contact information for the US Department of Labor. And I think that wraps it up for us so we can start answering some of these 51 questions in the Q&A. Good job, guys. So Amaya, how do we want to do this? Just kind of go to the oldest one first. Or Kamara, is yeah, that let's, to... yeah, I would go to the low uh, first one <laughs> and kind of just go through them. Okay, with your <clears throat> judgment on what has okay. already been answered and what hasn't. Okay, um, our work permits available online to print. Yes, if you go to Michigan.gov/wagehour and you click where it has youth employment, you can download the web the uh, work permits. They no longer have to be pink or yellow. You can just print them off white. But again, as Randall mentioned, the work permit for the 14, 15 year olds is in the landscape view. Um, we've seen lots of old work permits that people are still using. So feel free to go on the website and get the most updated version. Uh, employers, you're all allowed to print it out and give it to the student to have the school fill it out. The minor, there's a part for the minor to fill out, a part for the school to fill out, and a part for the employer to fill out. The completed work permit should end up back with the employer to stay on file while that minor is employed. Uh, do they have to be renewed? The, the work permit, if they change ages, it's always helpful to go get an updated work permit. Um, agricultural businesses, do the same rules apply? If a business is involved in agriculture, growing and cultivating crops, then the miner is exempt. If they are processing crops for another grower, then they would be covered under these acts. On our website, we have FAQs and questions 20 through 24 are specifically about agricultural employment. And I think you will find that helpful. If you have work permits for interns, 
through 2020 and they keep working for you, that, that's sufficient. They don't need to get a new one. Um, the work permit needs to be filled out. We talked about that. It stays with the employer. You, sh you can keep paper copies of the work permit. They're supposed to be on site of the location. Okay, let's see. If the miner has a break in service, they should come back and get a new work permit. Um, okay. If an employee, if a miner has changes in job duties or position is a new permit update required? No, but be careful that you're not asking them to do something that's prohibited. There's certain occupations that miners should not be. Um, if the internship is 100% virtual, the work permit rules still apply. They still do apply because the employer is allowing somebody to work for them. And the work permit at the end of the miners' employment should be returned to the school. I know that doesn't happen all the time, but it does. Um, that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, are any of these bullet points new or is mostly review? The only thing that's really new right now is the amendments about the work permits being able to be issued not in person and that they don't have to be pink but or yellow. But please keep an eye on our website as, as things update. Most of this is review. Uh, minor, here's a good question for you, Jill. Can a minor 15 or 16 work in a manufacturing type workplace if the minor is not operating any machinery? Okay, um, before I answer that, I just kind of want to make a comment that if somebody's working virtually, they might not be having adult supervision and you could have a problem there. Good point. Good so point. Thank you, Joe. You have to have adult supervision. Yes. In a manufacturing setting, yes, they can work for a manufacturer employer as long as they're not doing anything hazardous. So that means that they can't be cleaning or touching or using any type of power driven machinery. They can't be using any forklifts. They can't be using any hoisting apparatuses. Um, obviously being taught their safety training, wearing their proper PPE, um, as long as they are not using dangerous chemicals or operating any machinery, like I said, hoisting forklifts, you should be okay. Perfect, thank you, Jill. Uh, what if the miner is working for their family logging business? Randall answered this question. If a miner is working for a business that's owned and operated by their parent or guardian, they are exempt from this act. Now, again, that's a parent or guardian. If it's a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle and they're not the parent or guardian, then no, the, the child should not work in a family logging business. But again, a business owned and operated by the miner's parent, their child is exempt. Um, both apply. Okay. They have to be owners and, and they have to have a day to day operation. Right. Right. I, um, here's a question Can a minor 14, 15 work with oil vats? Um, I'm not quite sure. Is that for hot oil at a restaurant? But, Jill, we talk about miners and hot oil, right? Yes. I mean, they're, they're under the act, there are very specific occupations that are prohibited and Randall covered a highlight of all of those with you but we do have what's called a general duty clause in the act and it just says in general a kid cannot be employed in a hazardous or injurious occupation so even if not strictly prohibited if it's something that is dangerous and could result in injury the kids can't do it so administratively we have decided on a few things that kids can't do and one of them is handling hot grease so in it has cooled to normal temperature, minors can't handle grease. We've seen too many kids have like full body, second, third degree burns. So administratively that's been decided that that's a hazardous occupation to handle it while it's still hot. Okay. Thank you, Jill. Um, we already talked about work permits. Can minors clean restaurant tables with glasses that had alcohol in them? Miners that are, that are 14, 15 should not work in the area of the restaurant where the alcohol sold or consumed. The miners can work in the kitchen washing those glasses, but they shouldn't be working in an area where it's sold or consumed. That's for the 14, 15 year olds. 
Uh, can minors operate a lawnmower? Uh, private residents, they certainly may. If it's for a business, they need to be at least 16 and have a work permit. Uh, what if a minor is doing virtual school and is not physically attending school and is not required to attend virtual classes live? The minor, if they are attending, if they're in virtual school and they're required to attend online or in person, they are in school. So that school's in session and they're 16, 17, they can work 24 hours. They should not be working during the time that they're required to attend classes, whether in person or online. But if they're ace, if it's an asynchronous day and the and the minors just told you have this assignment that's due by noon tomorrow, that's homework and they could work. Mm -hmm. Right. It's only when they're required to attend. Right. Okay. If a 17 year old has graduated high school to the same 48 hours per week will apply in the summer. No, if they're a high school graduate, then they're exempt from the act. So just keep copy of their high school diploma, even if they're under 18. I'm sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing here. Uh, oh, 17 year old graduated, they, they can work unsupervised, but as May, Randall had pointed out, uh, somebody that's under 18 cannot provide adult supervision for other minors. Uh, we talked about a uh, standard deviation form for minors. We have the deviation form available on our website. We have an individual hours deviation, which the employer can apply for each minor that's 16, 17. They would need to submit a copy of the work permit and the parent's written consent. Or an employer can submit a general hours deviation, which would apply to all the minors that are 16, 17. The employer, once general hours is approved, the employer needs to keep a copy of the minor's work permit and the written parental permission to work those deviated hours. If a minor's parent doesn't want them to work those devi deviated hours, the employer can't force a minor to do that. Um, Jill, do you want to answer this work permit process for homeschooled students? Sure. Um, parents cannot issue work permits. Uh, the law officer <laughs> is somebody um, designated by a superintendent in writing at a public school or a, a, a charter school or a public academy to have that authority to do so. So a homeschooled um, minor can go to the district that he or she lives in or he or she is going to be employed in to have that work permit issued, but they have to bring a signed statement from the school or the teacher or the parent, if they're the teacher, stating how many hours per week that minor is in school, potentially even now with all of this virtual stuff, the starting and ending times of their actual school days. And then that issuing officer can issue that and keep a copy of that with the work permit on file at the school. Thank you, Joe. Um, minors may not be employed during hours or required to be in school. There's not a um, an hour deviation required for that. If an, if an employer is not sure what hours a minor is required to attend, they should have a copy of that minor's schedule and that let them work during the hours they're required to be in school. Again, we answer that question very thoroughly on our FAQs. The next question I want to answer is uh, a new youth program, a trucking company. Can minors who are 16 and 17 years of age drive company vehicles from the main office to the trucking yard, which is a mile on the main road? We haul vehicles that can drive the V. Oh, yeah. Minors should not drive on public roads as a main part of their job duty. So I would say the 16, 17 year olds should not be doing this. Randall or Jill, would you add anything to that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh. Okay. oh. No, I, I agree. That's a regular, that's driving. That's not, that's not uh, incidental. It's not a yeah situation yeah. that's a job duty and it would be prohibited right okay a uh, minor that is age 17 is graduated from high school they are exempt so you can be 16 17 be a high school graduate and you would be exempt just the employer would just keep copies of that high school diploma 
And Act 90 does apply to virtual work experiences. And as Jill pointed out, adult supervision may be a big, big issue for that. Okay. Uh, adult supervision, and Randall's answering that. Um, um, if a minor is graduated, they need to, uh, business is still treating them as a minor, making sure they don't use certain chemicals. If, if the minor's under 18, Act 90 does apply to them, but if they're under 18 and they've graduated, Act 90 doesn't apply to them. Your employer can say, you know, they're under 18. I want you to, you know, make sure they don't use this chemical or that they keep track of their hours. The employer can do that. Okay. Um, we talked about deviations. And there's a question here about a parent of a minor owns an establishment that sells alcohol. Can they serve alcohol after 16 years of age? That's not anything we could answer. That would be a liquor control question. Yeah, we talked about how much you can pay a minor. You know, Michigan's minimum wage is nine sixty-five. We have the training wage. Okay, we just answered our question. Oh, are all minor? Here we go, Jill. Here's a good question for you: Are all minor employees subject to having the standard taxes, federal, state, and city deducted from their pay? Are they exempt? They still have to pay taxes. Okay, if a minor is employed in a seasonal operation for summer 2021, go back to school, comes back. Uh, I and they is that continuous employment? If they left for this for the school year and came back, I would say they need to get a new work permit when they come back to work. Can minors collect unemployment? That's up to the unemployment agency. We don't not be able to answer that. How are we doing on time? Are they going to let us? Oh, we got so many more questions. Um, Maya, Jennifer, do we have, yeah, do we have a way we can follow up on with people? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think what I will do, if there are any remaining questions, I will um, export them and those that the questions came from, and we will reach out directly. OK. Yeah, you folks have asked great questions and I wish we had more time to answer them, but we'll get in touch with you or you can contact our office directly, uh, michigan.gov slash wage hour. Wonderful, wonderful questions. And I'm yeah. so glad that we did this. I, I know there's a great need for it and I appreciate you all taking your time today to attend this. Right, and we also have um, an email address, which is whinfo at michigan.gov for general questions, too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, everybody stay safe and well, and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.